thanks so much for watching. Now, you know, uh, I hope you've noted that we've gone back into the Hebrew quite a bit in these first um, five chapters of uh, this great book, um, uh, In the Beginning, uh, and uh, it does you well to know what the manuscripts say. And if you find it different, always stick with God's Word and disregard what man teaches. Go by God's Word and you'll never go wrong. Do you know why? God is the one that judges you. And God speaks in such a uh, simple way. Uh, always, usually pretty natural, whereby we can better understand. Now, we come to the sixth chapter, and we're going to be dealing with fallen angels. Uh, this chapter has been a chapter that is skipped over by many people, discussed very little by some so-called churches, and uh, I will never, when we teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you will never find me skip a chapter because of controversy. If we're going to teach God's Word, um, we're not too nice for God. If you are, you're just about nice enough to end up in a lake of fire if you're not real careful. So you want to take God's Word as it is written. Um, that is not an apology for teaching God's Word as um, I see it. It is my opinion. You do with it what you like. Okay, chapter 6, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Let's go with it. Remember that uh, we're down to Noah now from in genealogy and his three sons. And from the time of Enoch and even before Enoch, wickedness had begun to grow among men. Why? Well, you'll find out in this chapter. And this verse 1 reads, and it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Now, it's important. You with companion Bibles, I'm not going to say a great deal, but you'll note that the word men here is actually singular with the article, meaning we're talking about Adam, okay? Verse 2. And the sons of God, underline that in your mind, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, uh, the sons of God are always, always, when used in this sense, speaking of angelic beings. Now, many people get all uptight when we talk about angels cohabiting with women. You got to remember, there are three parts to the body, soul, body, and spirit. Now, angelic spirits can visit us at this time, but they also have a body that partook of angels' food, which is what manna was, which means it sustained even the flesh body for 40 years in the wilderness. So there's not, it is really very simple in as much as God said, let's make them to look exactly as we do. So the body makeup for this earth age, now, this heaven age and this earth age is as it appears. So we're going to document a little bit, if we may, what these sons of God, they read the, what were they supposed to do? God created the woman to bear children. That is to say, um, giving each entity an opportunity to pass through this earth age to love God or Satan. And these particular angelic beings, and we'll document it from the manuscripts before this chapter, we get very much farther into it. They saw that they were beautiful, that's what the term fair means, and they lusted after them. And rather than to be born to woman, they came and took her to wife, meaning they seduced her. Now, I want to talk, I want you to think seriously about the sons of God. You with companion Bibles are fortunate indeed because you have an appendix on the sons of God, as well as their offspring, which you will find in appendix 26. 3, 25, and 26. Three entire appendix on this um, 
particular uh, subject. Now I'm going to take you to the book of Job and we're going to talk about Job just a little bit in the 38th chapter where Job for 38 chapters has listened to his three friends and God finally said to Job in verse 2, he said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? You've been listening to these three knuckleheads and, and he says they're totally without knowledge. What are you listening to them? He said, why don't you look at me, Job? And this is what, where Job fell down. He didn't consider the greatness of our father. And father told him, get up from there and stand up and act like a man. And let me ask you a question. Where were you before I laid the foundations of this earth? Where were you when I put things in the place that they are? That takes man and makes him a little bit small and is very humbling. And he continues, the, the reason I'm saying this is so that you realize we're, bef we're before, as God is talking here, that flesh man was created. So that you know we're talking about the sons of God. Now let's listen to it and let's pick it up in Job verse 6 in chapter 38. And it reads, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? God asking Job, what, what holds this earth in its place? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof, of this, of this erets, that's to say the earth, seven. When the morning stars sharpened up for me, sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You know, it was really a happy time before Satan rebelled. The whole host, all souls were there, and they rejoiced, and they were happy. And naturally, after Satan uh, rebelled, well, certainly, um, then things took on a different complexion as we have a record of in Ezekiel 28, which is a different subject for a different time. I want to go all the way to the book of Jude, which is just before the New Testament. I'm sorry, before the book of Revelation. And remember the angels that were in holding there for destruction? Do you know why that God already had, had judged them to destruction? Well, it's written here. And it's the same angels we're going to be covering about called the sons of God here. So let's go to the book of Jude and let's take verse 6. Absorb it and listen to it. Let the word speak for itself. And the angels which kept not their first estate, that means heaven, but left their own habitation and came to this world, of course, and took wives. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And he continues on, and um, so that you know he's they're without spot, they're, they have nothing. That's to say the fallen angels and their progeny, those that left their first estate, it sealed their death sentence. Do you remember Enoch that was transformed um, in the lineage of Adam? We covered it in the last lecture. Well, he's mentioned here also so that you know we're talking about Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam prophesied of these. Tells you what he prophesied of, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. And that's exactly how it will be at the end when Satan and his angels are kicked out on this earth again. So, you bet, they are the sons of God, but they were fallen angels. They're mentioned more than one time, and before we complete this book of Genesis, you're going to even hear them called Raphim, a uh, different lecture for a different time, because there was a second influx of these uh, beings, angelic beings. Okay, now let's return to that sixth chapter. The sons of God are angelic beings that left their habitation, that's why they're called Nephilim, and I'll be showing you in the Hebrew in a moment, and Napha to fall, the fallen angels. Okay, verse 3, back in Genesis chapter 6, and it reads, And the Lord said, 
My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Now the he here is emphatic because the man has the article and this makes it emphatic so that you know it's talking about Adam through whom Christ would come. Don't, don't ever think for a minute Satan did not know which people it would be through which woman would give birth to Messiah. He knew and he was trying again to destroy that woman as simply as he had in the impregnation that brought forth Cain. So the he makes it emphatic. He also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Now N Noah would have been 810 years old when this was given. And 120 years later, he died at 930 years old. We consider this the second meaning that it is another length of generation that he gives man. Okay, let's continue on, if we may, to verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God, you got it? Now remember who they are. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children. Do I have to tell you what was going on? They bear children to them. No doubt about it. The same became mighty men which were of old, which meant they had the ability in as much as the angels knew what happened in the first earth age, meaning of old, men of renown. Now I want to take that word giants as it is used here, and let's go to the Hebrew if we may. I want you to know what it means so that no man can strip you of truth. It's nephil. It, nephil, um, and actually it, it means a properly, I want you to note that the prime was 5307 there, but it just rolled off the screen. Properly a feller, bully. Now let's go to that prime to get the plural, natha, I mean it, nafel, it comes, that's the prime root. It's a primitive root to fall in a great variety of applications, and naturally these fallen angels fell to this earth so that you're locked in and you know exactly what happened there, who these angelic beings were, and how that God in the first four verses of that great book of Jude already has them in holding after the flood, whereby when they are cast out with Satan in Revelation 12, 7, 7,000, which is the number, will die instantly. And that's written in your book of Revelation, chapter 11. And they will have fulfilled their purpose in testing men. So it's good for you to go into the Hebrew and learn. All this, the numbers that you saw, in case you've never studied with us before, is simply uh, brought forth from a strong concordance, which that in a King James allows the English reader to check out the languages to see if what they have been told is true or not. All right? Okay? So let's continue on, if we may, in verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. In other words, this didn't just start in the sixth chapter. It was back at the time that Cain seed, the genealogy ended there, and as I told you, that word began means they began to talk against the living God, it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It went on night and day. Um, when it gets bad enough that God can only destroy it with the flood to get rid of the ungodly um, misfits, that is to say, the Geba, the, um, the uh, progeny of woman and giants, then certainly um, we can see that um, uh, it was bad. Now what you want to realize, in Matthew 24, Jesus said, hey, 
You know what it's going to be like when I return to this earth? It's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage and dancing. That, with who? With the fallen angels. That happens at Revelation 12, 7 when Michael cast them out to the earth de facto. Not just Satan's spirit, but he walking again on the earth where Christ has forbid him to at this time because he must stay behind Christ until Christ releases him to test this generation when he comes as super Jesus, the false Christ, or some call Antichrist. It's going to happen. It would be for this same reason that Paul would say in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, that women should keep their heads covered because of the angels. They're coming back, friend. I don't say that to frighten anyone, but that's what God's word states. It shall happen. Let's continue. Verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. In other words, before this, man had never been flesh. Now he was like an animal in that sense. And certainly the animalistic traits certainly came forth when you put the supernatural among them. But you haven't seen anything yet. Wait till the supernatural begin to work their miracles as it is written in Revelation 13:11 when the false one comes. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. In other words, ultimately that will come to pass. Why? We change into spiritual bodies where the the lion lays down with the lamb and the bear eats hay like a cow, okay? So that naturally requires a change. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah being meaning comforter in the Hebrew tongue, and certainly God found comfort. So, yes, it will come to pass that God will take man from the flesh again. It will happen at the seventh trump. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked, I want to repeat that, and Noah walked with God. Now, you're not going to have it, but I want to tell you what the word perfect means here. Perfect is tamim in the Hebrew tongue, and it means he was without a spot or blemish. And here you can see the coming through of the Christ child, that he had to be a sacrifice without spot or blemish. So we see that woman was saved. To bring forth Messiah, Satan fell uh, in trying to destroy that perfect line because I want you to know what generations mean. It doesn't mean generation like you might think. So I want to give you another little Hebrew lesson here, if I may. First of all, so that you know the subject, Toledo or Toleda. And it comes from a prime root, 3205. In other words, we'll have to go there for you to really get the plural only. It means to begat. All right, do you know what begat, the word we just left? It means to begat. Now, here is the prime root. To bear young, causatively to begat. That's so that you can see the childbirth. Medically, to act as a midwife. That means to assist in a delivery. Specifically, to show lineage. Now, that's the part I wanted you to get. We're going to roll it. Let's, let's have that back if we can. Is it possible? May not be able to do that. But anyway, if you consider, if we had continued the roll, you would have seen the fact that it was their pedigree, their lineage, the genes, meaning he had perfect uh, within his sons, his wife, and his family. They had not intermixed 
with the fallen angels or anyone else that had, that they still had a spotless pedigree. I know this makes some people nervous, but that's what it means, their lineage. Because Satan tried to destroy that lineage because it would be this man, Ha'adam, through Noah now to that in, that in those genes that would bring forth the Christ child. He wanted from the very beginning to destroy that. So in the causative sense, lineage, pedigree, the prime of the word generations. Now, I would like it very much. It would please me if you would check that out for yourself. Simply take your Strong's, take the word generations as it is used in the sixth chapter and the ninth verse, take it back to the Hebrew dictionary, and then go always go to the prime so that you really have the foundation of the very word itself. Oftentimes even the etymology can be gained from that of the word. So we see that we have one man that has not intermixed, they're not hybrids in his family. And he was still without spot and blemish whereby through those genes could come the Messiah, the Christ child, and be, produced, be uh, secured as the sacrifice without spot and blemish for all of our sins. Otherwise, you would be in sad shape today because there would not have been a perfect one to have paid for our wicked sins that we do in the flesh body. I'm sorry, the flesh causes us to sin. Now, let's continue right on. I hope that no one has any problem seeing what happened in those verses. What was going on that displeased God? God's plan was trying, Satan was trying to destroy it by attacking the woman naturally through the man. Okay, verse 10 of the sixth chapter, let's go with it. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now these are not in order, and I'll explain that further in the book of Genesis. Verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. I mean, it, it was bad. It was really bad. Why? With those supernatural entities, Satan almost succeeded. Verse 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Now that takes in six-day creation, eight-day creation, all flesh. That's, that's not, that's all the races created had in some way been um, tainted uh, in large part by what had happened. Verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth, or it means destroy them from the earth. Better translated, all right? Many of your King James will verify that. That will come to pass. Don't think God is short, has a short uh, memory. At the seventh trump, the, the human part of that will take place. At the end of the millennium, the rest of it will. That is to say, the animal kingdom. Verse 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Now, this word um, pitch, uh, shall pitch it, is kafir, kafir in the Hebrew tongue. It's the only word in the Hebrew language used for atonement. It means to cover it over and protect it, whereby it will save you from the flood. I think the reason that was that particular word was used here, as the to, to cover it, is the covering that we have in Christ for the flood of the end times mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, which is not, I repeat, not a flood of water, but a flood of lies that this same destroyer, Satan, 
who brought this wickedness into the world will flood the religions with lies to get them to even believe a lie and you had better be covered over or pitched over in the ark of the end times which is to say the truth with Christ to protect you or you will be in the middle of those lies of deception listening to Antichrist saying he's come to rapture you out before the true Messiah returns. Hey, it's your decision friend. Have a good day. Have a good life. And I hope you follow God's plan. Verse 15. And you, then I should say you'll also have a good life in the eternity. Otherwise, hey, you make your own bed. 15. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubics. Think about that. 300 cubics. The breadth of it, 50 cubics, cubits. And the height of it, 30 cubits. You're going to have three decks, 10 foot uh, to the deck. All right. The, um, a, a, a cubit was, um, it is believed by some scholars that have, at this time that the cubit would be anywhere from 17.5 up to the sacred cubit, which was about 25 inches. And I don't want to go into how a cubit was determined uh, down through the years. It would serve no purpose. But you might multiply 300 times 25 or 17.5 inches and you see you got a pretty long ship here only it's really a house uh, type 16 a window shalt thou make to the ark and in a cubic shall cupid shall thou finish it above and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower second and third stories shalt thou make it you know spiritually speaking there are three levels how often there are three levels in god's teachings there are three earth ages and there are three in the godhead so it is amazing at how perfect god's plan is and even in this ark of salvation for these, we see these facts are God's plan, always perfect. 17, and behold, I, even I, that makes it emphatic, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Now, understand, let's go one more verse, 18. But with thee will I establish my covenant. This is my contract. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy son's wives with thee. Now remember, they had perfect genes of Adam. They hadn't mixed. There were no hybrids among them. They were all Adamic whereby Christ could come of that family. That makes eight Adamic souls. Does that mean everybody else died? Well, we know they didn't because the Kenite is still with us and so are the other races. How do, how do we manage that? Verse 19. And of every living thing of all flesh... Well, what does that mean? Every living thing of all flesh. Well, are the Kenites flesh? Of course they are. Are the other races flesh? Of course they are. Two, and they are living, right? You see them? Yes. They're living, of course. And we're living beings. Two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark. To keep them alive with thee, they shall be male and female. In other words, you will pick and you will take into the ark uh, two of all flesh. Uh, was he speaking about man only here? Well, it, his sons and daughters, the topic was souls, and there were eight Adamic souls above board the ark, but there was most likely two of all races including Kenites. 
with souls aboard the ark also. Verse 20, of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come into thee, unto thee to keep them alive. 21, and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, consumed by the various uh, species, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. In other words, God always plans ahead. I don't know, you want to think about your ark of the end times? We know we got a five month period. Surely everybody has their pantry well supplied for at least 30 days, especially when they can't do any buying or selling. But then the whole purpose is to have God's elect delivered up as it's written in Mark 13 when this false Christ or the spurious Messiah will, will uh, return as Christ said in that same chapter, Mark 13, not that maybe the false Christ would come, but that certainly he would come before Christ himself would return or before any gathering out would take place. And you're going to live through it. Maybe. And maybe, maybe you'll even live through it without being deceived as to what's happening. Because God has foretold you all things in his word. Verse 22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Hey, do you want to know a verse that will really bring you blessings? We just read it. You want to know why? Noah found grace. It didn't mean he was perfect. It was only his pedigree that was perfect. But he found grace, which means unmerited favor. But thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. He obeyed God. And when you obey God, God's going to bless you. Now, many, the wheels might be turning and you might be saying, well, do, do you know, angelic beings cohabiting with woman, I've never heard such a thing. Well, then you've never read God's word. You've never read the Bible. You've never been taught the Bible if you haven't heard it before because it is brought forth even in the English whereby a child can understand it. And the second witnesses are so plentiful throughout the word of God of the actual event and what transpired as to, you know, many might take it from a different angle. Why would God kill 7,000 angelic beings on the day that the two witnesses rise from the streets of Jerusalem? Well, because their name is even dead. They blew their chance, as it is written in the book of Jude, when they left their habitation. In other words, they were trying through Satan to totally disrupt the plan of salvation of the living God. It's that simple. It's beautiful. You know, I do not find God's word boring or uninteresting. I find it fascinating. There has been much mythology written by other peoples other than Christianity and um, students of the Torah. Much mythology concerning the giants. Uh, certainly even in Babylon itself, their record of the giants. And there are records today that people know. I'm talking about scholars now. But it's just easier not to talk about it. Don't shake the boat. Well, if you don't cover the boat of your life over well with atonement in Christ's truth, for he is the whole word, not just a little verse here or there, your boat's probably going to sink. I'm talking about your Christian boat of life, lifeboat. You're not going to make it if you're not armed with the gospel armor and the very thing that keeps your britches on about the gospel armor is the truth. If you don't have the truth, you don't have a belt, and you're going to lose your britches. 
you're going to enter the kingdom embarrassed. That's very biblical. I just put it in a little colloquial way there that perhaps you can get a better understanding. I hope that you don't want to stand there that way. By that I mean I hope you accept God's Word, this truth, to know how it began in the beginning whereby you can also understand the end. Hope you've enjoyed the first six chapters. There you have it. Thanks so much for watching.